Hi, it's Rob Moore here for my podcast, The Disruptive Entrepreneur. Now, I've come up to Liverpool. Uh, I'm a Liverpool fan. I'm watching the game later. And I've just interviewed John Barnes. So come with me, uh, a deep dive interview about football, business, life, raising kids, everything. And get this, he also signed my shirt. And I didn't have a Liverpool shirt. So in the end, I just had to get him to sign my um, top instead. But um, I'm a big fan. So I think you'll love the interview whether you support Liverpool or not. John, thanks for doing the interview. No problem really at all. Really appreciate it. Do you remember the time in your life where you thought, I'm definitely going to be a footballer? Was there like a specific time, a moment? Well, first of all, I grew up in Jamaica. And my dad played football for Jamaica. So I knew I'd always play football. Mm. So I knew I would always play football. But playing football and being a footballer in, this, in, the, in the sense of the real world of being a professional footballer are two different things. Mm. Because I knew had I stayed in Jamaica, I would have been a footballer. At that time, there was no professional football, so I wouldn't have been a professional footballer. I would have obviously maybe had to have a job, but I would still play football. Mm. So if you ask me when I knew I'd be a footballer, it was when I was f- five, six years old. If you ask me when I knew I was going to be a professional footballer, yeah, yeah. right, so that's a little bit different. Mm. That I, I was probably about 15, 16. Because right. when we came to England, my dad was a diplomat, so it was a four-year posting. So I was 13 years old. And my my family were then going to go back to Jamaica when I was 17. So we knew that. So I knew I was coming to England. We're going back to Jamaica when I'm 17. When I was 16, because obviously I was a a good footballer ever since I was young growing up in Jamaica. Um, If you're a good footballer in Jamaica, you get a scholarship to go to an American university. I got offered a scholarship to um, Howard University in Washington, a football scholarship, which would mean I would then go and do a degree, play football, and then once again, no professional football, so I'll do whatever, but I'd still play football. Mm. And then, probably about not even less than a year before we were going to go back, Watford, my first club, yeah. saw me playing in Sudbury Court. A scout came and watched me, and that's the first time I then thought I'm going to be a professional footballer. So I was yeah. probably 16 when I, when I f- thought I was going to be a professional footballer. I knew I was good enough to be a professional footballer, but back then you had to be very lucky to be spotted because I played with so many of my contemporaries in London at 15, 16, who were equally as good as me, they weren't spotted. Uh I had to be spotted because a taxi driver knew a scout watching me play. And there's so many players who were lost to the professional game because they were never spotted. So so some of it is luck. Well, uh, well, fate, luck, whatever you want to say. Yeah, Yeah, you know, Mm. the thing about it is that, um, yeah, whatever you want to call it, but you have to be in the right place at the right of time. Course. That's the same in anything. Yeah. Now it's a little bit different because now if you've got any talent at all, you will be known as, as six, seven, eight, nine year olds we were just speaking about, mm. footballer. So you will be given an opportunity. No one is now not going to be given an opportunity. Yeah. Whereas back then, um, if that taxi driver hadn't stopped to watch me play, maybe a scout would never have seen mm. me. Uh, and had he even st- hadn't even watched me play, but I had a bad game, he wouldn't even have thought twice. Yeah. So I prefer to call it fate than luck. Mm. And do you think now it's maybe easier to get spotted because there's more people looking and because anyone can do a social media video? Well, it's a lot of it is more to do with the relationships now the clubs have with either the local boys, youth clubs or the schools. Mm. Because a lot of the clubs are now in the schools and then you play for the school, you play for the district and the scouts are now watching football all over. So as I said, there's no seven, eight year old who is any good who will not be given an opportunity at a professional club. Yeah. Um, so it's not so much that they're looking more, it's just obviously the relationships now between the clubs and grassroots football, particularly at schools, uh, is much stronger. Yeah. So, you know, there, there are no kids now who, who won't be spotted. Sure. And is that stronger because just natural progression or because it's become more of a business of football? Well, I, I don't, that, that dynamic of being spotted is stronger. There aren't any more kids coming through because there can't be any more kids coming through. There are a certain amount of clubs, there are a certain amount of footballers. There aren't more footballers coming through to play for the top teams because the top teams, okay, instead of having maybe 30 in the squad, you have 60. But generally speaking, the players will, will always come through. Mm. What, you, th- what you do have is many more people being given opportunities. Yeah. What you then have is a lot, of more, lot more people being rejected. Because we were talking about that. Exactly. We so yeah. they have so many kids coming in. Um, and obviously, 90, 90% of them won't actually make it. Mm. Um, so... It's more to do, I think, with the fact that, as I said, there can't be, there aren't more footballers playing now than there were when I was playing. And I suppose back then, you really had to be perceived as being a special player to be given an opportunity. Mm. Whereas now, because of course back then they weren't thinking about development rates, that you could develop quicker 
than others or later than others. You know, you had to really look as if you could be a player. Whereas now the clubs understand that, okay, you are small, you could develop, so we're going to take a chance on you. Whereas once upon a time, they wouldn't take a chance on you because they're looking at you and judging you there and then. Yeah. They're not thinking in three years time, you're going to get bigger, you're going to get stronger, you could improve. You really had to be the finished article to actually, because don't forget they're then looking at you at a later age. Because back then you were going to clubs when you were 15. At, at the youngest, really. Mm -hmm. So if you're 15, you're virtually a, a man, they can see that you're going to be a professional. You can't tell whether a six-year-old is going to be. No matter how good you are at six, you can't tell what it's going to be like at 15. So whereas back then, you weren't looking at six, seven-year-olds. You're really looking at, 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 at the finished, nearly the finished product as a 15-year-old. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the amount of players coming through now aren't, aren't greater than, than when I played. Sure. And do you think people in the game, the scouts, you know, the clubs can see or predict how someone will develop because they've got better technology, better understanding of the body and experience? Not necessarily. They just take a chance on taking everybody. Right. <laughs> so this is basically a numbers game. Yeah. And so that you, means more people get chewed out. Absolutely. And, and, and for every Steven Gerrard who you can see, or Robbie Fowler, so you can see a, a, a seven, eight, nine-year-old and you can say, he's going to make it. And can you actually see that? Sometimes but they're very, But there are very, very, very yeah. few of them. But what they do is they may take... 59 year old, they can see one's going to make it, they've got a chance, the other 49 may not, but you really can see the really special ones who will then go all the way through. Yeah. You, can, you, you, you can see that. But just in case the others develop, you take them just in case. Mm. And then what happens is you weed them out, you bring more in, you weed them out, you bring more in. And that is why I was just saying earlier, I'm not a real fan of that because my thing, being a father of many children, <laughs> is the development of the child, mm. not development as a footballer. I'm looking at the development of a footballer when you get into maybe. 14 at earliest to then say, okay, you're going to make it as a footballer, now you have to concentrate on being a footballer. Mm. Whereas as a 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 year old, you want you to have, be a 7, 8, 9, 12 year old child, mm. to have that, that, that dynamic with your friends, playing with your friends and doing different things and experiencing what it's like to be young, rather than being in a professional football environment at 8, living mm. like a professional footballer. Because rejection is a hard thing for a seven, eight, nine year old to take. When you get to 14, 15, and you want to be a footballer and you're rejected, okay, you're becoming an adult, you can understand, you can accept that. You can't tell a seven year old after selling him a dream of being a professional footballer, all of a sudden he's just discarded. You're yeah. thinking about his development as a person, as a child growing up. So, um, you know, as I said, it, 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 it's a fine line because, you know, clubs will say we need to get them in as young as possible, and they, they sell that to people and the, to parents. The dream of being, um, but I still think that if you, um, okay, Jamie Vardy is, a, is, a, is an extreme whereby you can still make it at 20 whatever. Um, but I still believe you can play for your local club until you're 14, 15. Because if you're good enough, you have that passion and that determination and that drive. And you've not either been spotted or taken to an academy, but you have that talent and you're still playing local football for the local team at 14, 15. You can still make it because people will see you as a 14, 15 year old. And, and you'll make it. You don't, I don't think you have to be at, a, at, a, at, a, at an academy when you're seven, eight, nine. Mm. Is there an argument, and I'm just playing devil, devil's advocate here, that if you're around better players and better coaches younger, you could develop quicker? Or, well, or on the other side of it, pick, could people peak too early? Well, if you look at, at kids in South America and Africa, they don't go to academies, but you look at their ability when they're seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. You start, I, I think you should start to really start coaching kids mm. when they're getting into 12, 13, 14. Mm. You know, kids at seven, eight, nine, you're talking about their development naturally as a footballer to do things that comes naturally to you to then see your natural talent. You can, I, can co I could coach a seven-year-old to control the ball who can't play football, but if I stay with him to control the ball, control the ball, he will then get to a certain level of being able to do that. What is his natural ability? Now, your natural mm. ability is, is what you're like without being coached, and that is where you see the great players. You don't coach the great players. Diego Maradona, even, even Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, even modern players, Lionel Messi, who may have been in an academy from when he was 11 in Barcelona. Barcelona didn't coach Lionel Messi. He was going to be, but then of course, when he then understood tactics and what it takes to be a professional footballer from a coaching perspective, when you're getting into your early teens, from seven, eight, nine, ten, you don't, I don't mm. think you need that. I have a bit of an ulterior motive for asking you this because I've got a six-year-old boy who played in the World Championships a year younger and all that. We're talking about it. Yeah. Golf is different. Yes. Because golf, for me, you can have a natural aptitude to golf, but golf is a sport that you can coach. Yes, and you have to. Mm. You have to. You can't not play golf and then all of a sudden pick up a golf club and play. Whereas with running, with athletic sports, you show a natural attitude to, to controlling the ball. You're not coached out to control the ball when you're six, seven, eight. 
you naturally do it because that is what, whereas in golf, you then have to do that. So for golf, mm. if you just go and you practice your swings, or whatever it is, you know, this is not golf, I'm playing cricket because I'm not a golfer, as you can see, <laughs> but it, as you know, you practice that, then you can manufacture that situation. Yeah. You have to have the natural talent for golf, mm. and I think that's where golf is probably a unique sport in that aspect. Whereas other sports, I think, you know, you can, you can have that natural aptitude towards it without being coached, then to get the very highest level, you need to be coached. Sure. Whereas I think from golf, you know, you, you, if your son doesn't play golf for the next five years, he's not all of a sudden going to pick up a golf club and be able to do what he did no. when he was five. Mm. Yeah, because I think there's a lot of paradoxes in this. One of them is I feel like if I get him very interested very early, it will be within, his, within who he is. Um, but I, I got advice from someone who's in the top ten best golfers in the world, and he said, you probably shouldn't get him even in competitions till they're eight. And then part of me thinks, well, I don't want my son to be, son to be shy and retiring, so I'm going to challenge him. But too much push, and you could break his passion for the thing, you know. Well, <clears throat> the thing about that... And you've got seven um, kids. So. Seven kids, so I know. So I've yeah. brought seven kids up. The thing about that is you have to know your own child. Mm -hmm. And what's right for one child may not be right for another child. So there's no right or wrong way of doing it, because if you know that's what your son needs, and you know better than the guy who's going to be telling you, then that's what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so with my children, as much as you know, my sons both played football and love football, wanted to be professional footballers when they were 10, I said, okay. All I insisted upon was an education that they do, that's what I was strict about. And I said, if you want to be a footballer, fine. Okay, no problem. Let me know when you're 13, 14, 15. And 13, my big son, who's now a doctor, just gave up. Mm. And if I then said, oh, you want to be a footballer in your eight, so forget everything else, then at 13, he still would have lost interest. Because when you're growing up, you had experienced different things and you like different things. Love football, then you, then you don't like football anymore. That is why when you always say, and I said, when you get to 14, 15, 16, and you still have that passion and determination, mm -hmm. that's when you can get serious about it. Because when you're growing up, you're going through adolescence, there's going to be girls, you may want to start going out when you're 15 with alcohol, and as much as you wanted to be a footballer at 12, that age between 12 and 15 with young boys, that's girls be, are a little more boys. All that other stuff's going to be way more exciting. It, it could be, yeah. it could be. Now, if it's not, and you want to be a footballer, fine. And that is why I'm saying with your children, you are just allow them to experience life because you speak to every, every eight-year-old boy, they want to be footballers, but by the time they get to 12, 13, they may change their minds. And secondly, what we're actually pushing um, in this modern age is not to be a footballer, it's to be a celebrity footballer, to be a footballer who plays for Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester United, Chelsea. Whereas in the past, you wanted to be a footballer, you have to have that passion, that determination as a consequence of that, you may play for Liverpool, mm. Chelsea, Arsenal, Man United. Which is probably a lot less pressure. As, as a consequence of your passion. Whereas now, I go to schools and I say to kids, who wants to be a professional footballer? Hands up in the air. All the hands up. I said, keep your hands in the air. I said, who wants to end up playing for Stockport County, earning 300 pounds a week till they're 31? All the hands come down. Mm. If one kid keeps his hand up in the air, I say, you'll make it as a footballer. Mm. Because that the drive you have to have is not to be, A, a professional footballer, it's to be a footballer. If it's to be a professional footballer, it's to play professional football, not to play Premier League football. If it wants to be a Premier League football, you've got to be prepared to play for Bournemouth, not Manchester United. Mm. But what we're now selling the kids of this dream is that you can play for Man United, Liverpool, Arsenal, which, okay, that's fine. But what we should be selling the dream of, if you want to be a footballer, you have to have the right dedication, passion, to, to follow that yeah. passion that you have to be, and we started off with this question, a footballer. And if you have that passion, you've got the talent, you then play for Man United. Mm. If you can't, you then play for Preston. If you can't, you play for Northampton. If you can't, you play Sunday League. And you have, because you go and watch Sunday League football now, and you still see 40 year old men who have that passion, who couldn't be a professional, but they still play football. Whereas the next generation aren't going to do that. The next generation, if they can't play top quality football, we're not going to play anymore. Well, so many people, some of the people who I know whose kids were at the academies and at Liverpool's academies, they got to 13, 14, they got released. And I'll say to them, oh, who do they play for now? Ah, oh, they just don't play anymore. So from Liverpool's academy, you, you love football, you're going to be a footballer, you don't make it at Liverpool. There's Preston, Bolton, Bury, so many clubs, Tranmere you could go to. But if I can't play for Liverpool, I don't want to play. Yeah. Now that's not the right attitude to have. You know, and unfortunately that's what a lot of these kids are being, are being sold. Yeah, I think, um, I think sportsmen could learn a lot from boxing because if you're a talented boxer, you don't go and fight with Muhammad Ali your first fight. Absolutely. You build your fights up Absolutely. and you just try and get a little bit more experience with people at your level. Yep. If you don't make it in an academy at 12, go and play for a club in the third division. Go and play for your, your local club. Well, build, yeah, build your way but back up. An academy, not even the third division. There's so much football around and local football for clubs. I go and do presentations for local clubs because my boys grew up playing at local clubs. And I remember when I was at Newcastle playing my last year, my son, who's a banker, he got a first in maths at Leeds, he's very, very bright, but he, he wanted to be a footballer when he was like even 17. 
And, and at Newcastle, when he was about eight, um, he played for a local club, and then that's when the academies were really taking off about 20 years ago. And they wanted him and two of his friends to go to the Newcastle Academy. And I said, you're not going to go. You're going to stay and play for the, your team. One of his friends went to the academy. And my son was very upset. I wanted to go, blah, blah, blah. That's boy, eight years old. Because when you play for the academies, you can't play with your friends anymore. Right. You can't play for the local club anymore. Can't you? So that's these, the rule. You can't play for your local club. You then go to the academy. Uh -huh. He got rejected one year later. He now come back to his friends, tail between his legs. And they're laughing at him because he didn't want to play with us last year. You thought you were too good for us. Now you're coming back. Now, not just a rejection, that then the, the, having to come back with the tail between your legs to someone place where you left before where people may be laughing at you because you thought you were too good to play for us. What does that do to his development course, as a nine-year-old yeah. boy or mm. an eight-year-old boy? And it's the rejection, which, and the reality is that, as I said, nine, more than 90% of them will get rejected. So I'm, and, and, and <clears throat> I don't necessarily blame the clubs because mm. the clubs want to get the best players, but the clubs aren't responsible for my child, I am. Yeah. I'm responsible for my child's upbringing, his development. So I blame the parents because the parents allow that. Mm. Because the parents are just so filled with my son's going to be a footballer rather than thinking, well, if he doesn't make it and he's been rejected, how's that going to... And as I said, if you think if that child's good enough, that nine-year-old who... And, and like if my son was good enough and he didn't go to the academy at nine and he's still playing and he gets to 14, 15 and he's still great, you don't think they'll come back and say, well, come to us now. Of course they will. So it's not as if you're going to miss the boat if no. you don't go. Just the timing is different for you. Not only is the timing different, he's then better able to handle either the rejection or being able to, to make it as a footballer at 14 or 15. Mm. So, you know, but I mean, so as I said, I don't blame the clubs because the clubs, the clubs concern, as it should be, is about trying to get the best player. They're not concerned about necessarily, yes, they try and help the child to develop and, you know, if they reject you, they try and fix you up with whatever else. But the overriding thing is that we are responsible for our children and our children's upbringing. So I would never blame a football club for rejecting my child and my child becoming depressed because he didn't make it, I'll blame mm. myself. Mm. It's funny because I've, I'm lucky enough in the position that I'm in to meet some many amazing people like yourself and many very successful people and virtually everyone I've met has not pushed their child to want to do what they did. And the people that are, and I'm going to be honest and chuck my cards on the table, I wanted to be a golfing professional when I was in my early teens, I didn't mm. quite make it for various reasons, girls was one of them. Mm. And so I know there's a part of me that's trying to live vicariously through my son and him achieve my dreams as well. And I've, I'm trying to be self-aware on that. And people like yourself and, and many other people I know, they don't do that with their children. And I think because they've made the success themselves, they're not trying to control who the child well, is. Well, I, I always say golf is a different, because I think you can, if a child has an aptitude, like I remember Justin Rose, mm. that's his name? I don't yeah. know much about golf, but I remember seeing this young boy play. Yeah, it was Justin, yeah. And all of a sudden he said, because I think if you start playing golf early and, you, and, you, and you're a, a good golfer, yeah. you're a good golfer, you can, can become a, a great golfer if you practice, 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 mm. practice, practice. Football, and I'm not going to mention his name um, because he's a very good friend of mine, but we always tease him. He's played more football than anyone I've known since he was... 12 years old, he plays five aside every day, he plays football, he's now in his 50s, plays every single day, he is the worst footballer you've ever seen. And if there's a situation where I say, if you keep practice, you keep practice, you keep practice, you keep practice, you will then become better. It's a natural game whereby, yes, if you're very, very good and you're a good player, you can improve, but if you can't play football, mm. you can't play football. If you can't play golf, but you practice every day, every day, practice, yeah. practice, practice, you will get better. That's true. But football is not like that. So yeah. um, that is why I think in your situation, and, you've got, and if your son's a good five-year-old golfer, very chances are he could go through to become a great golfer if he just keeps that up. Mm. Whereas in football, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. No. Mm. So I've got this, I always have this struggle when I try to help people. And that is like, you're saying that statistically, 90, 95, and even 99% of footballers don't make it. If you accept that as someone who wants to be successful, you're almost letting your dream go. So how do you balance saying, I want to be successful at whatever I want to do and believing in yourself, knowing statistically the odds are way against you? Well, no, you can be successful. How you can be successful is to maximise your t potential to be the best player you can be. Mm -hmm. And if that means you're going to play for Tranmere Rovers, that's all you can do. You can't do any more. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> it's not a question of statistics. It's a question of knowing what your level is and what your abilities are. So, because with all the best will in the world, yeah, I have a dream and I'm going to train really hard and I'm going to practice every day because I want to beat Usain Bolt. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. So like golf, and football is very similar, and all sport is, and life is, it's a challenge against yourself to do as well as you can. Because mm. golf, you don't play against other people. You play against yourself. Yeah. 
And in many respects, sports like that, football is like that. Because if I, no matter how good I am, that's why I use this as an example. I will be more successful than Usain Bolt if I race against Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt's best time is 9.2. I race against him. And in that race, Usain Bolt does 12 seconds, yeah? And I do 12.2 seconds. He beats me. Mm. He wins the race, but I'm more successful than him because I've maximized my potential and he has it. Yeah. And that's what in golf you have to do. That's what in tennis you have to do. No matter how good you are, you're never going to be, everybody can't be the best, but you can be the best you can be. And if the best you can be as a footballer means that you're going to end up playing for Stockport County, then you can't ask anymore. Mm. You can't then say, I'm giving him a dream of playing for Liverpool because if you're not able to, because you're not that good, there's nothing you can do. But what you can do, be true to yourself and say, I'm going to try 100% to maximize my potential. And as a consequence of that, some will play for Liverpool, some will play in the championship, some will play in the first division, some will play, yeah. and then some will play Sunday League football. Everybody has a dream to be the best. We can't all be the best, no. but what we can do is be the best we can be. Mm. So you're saying ba almost balancing a dream with some, some kind of realism. Self-awareness, I prefer, I prefer having realism with some kind of dream. Yeah. So again, that way <laughs> that's, that's, the, yeah. That, that's, that's really the way to, to, yeah. to look at it. And even from a fan's perspective, because, you know, when you look at football, and you look at football in this age now, whereby, you know, money is very important. You're looking at, and I use Arsenal as an example, Arsene Wenger maximizes that potential of that Arsenal squad. And if that means that the best they can do is finish third, you can't ask any more of him. Mm. You, you know, you can't, because if Man City and Chelsea, particularly Man City, have this spending power whereby come January, if Arsenal are beating them, they can spend 500 million and then win because they can do that, as Paris mm. and Germain have done. You can't ask Arsene Wenger to, to, to compete against that. Mm. So um, we have to be realistic. And we're living, because of this age, we live now in, a, in this celebrity age whereby, and particularly football fans who remember the history of Liverpool or of Arsenal, well, who are Man City to be beating us? Because, yeah. you know, we've won the Champions League five times or whatever. And I say, you know who will win the league? Swindon Town is bought by Xi Jinping from China, and then he puts five billion pounds in. Swindon Town is going to be the best team. Mm. Swindon Town, who are Swindon? Because we're Manchester United and Liverpool, and it doesn't really matter. No. Those days are now gone. So we have to be realistic in, in, in what we can achieve and all you can ask anybody to do is maximize your potential with yeah. all of the managers, everybody in life. And if you maximize your potential, and that means by maximizing potential, you finish, put it this way, if you look at Liverpool and people say to me, what do you want for Liverpool? And to show you the team you are, it's about, yes, winning the league, but it's getting to the, close to the top as, 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 as possible. Mm. So would I be happier, because I remember when we won the Champions League, would I be happier with Liverpool winning the Champions League and finishing sixth, 40 points off first, or finishing fifth, 10 points off first and not winning the Champions League? When you finish fifth, 10 points off the top, that shows you've not got far mm. to actually win and you're moving in the right direction. Winning the Champions League and 40 points off the top, you could be very lucky to win the Champions League because when Germany got to the World Cup final in 2002, they played USA in the quarterfinals and South Korea in the semifinals in a cup competition when you could be lucky to draw Tranmere, Swindon Town, other teams. Mm. That doesn't mean that you're a good team. You just mm. have to get a good draw. Whereas okay. in the league, where you've got to play 40 games against the top team to show you how good you are. Mm. So maximize your potential is about us getting as close to your potential as possible, which cup matches don't do because you yeah. don't know who you're going to play against. Mm. It's like when people talk about England and they say, what should England do in the World Cup? And people say, we should get to the quarterfinals. How can you say that when you don't know who you're going to play? Yeah. Because if you get to the last 16 and then you draw Germany, chances are Germany will beat you. So you're not going to get to the quarterfinals. But if you draw a South Korea, then in the quarterfinals, you draw Costa Rica, then in the semifinals, you, so you can actually win it. Yeah. But what I will say is that I would expect England to get through the group stages mm -hmm. because you know who you're going to have in your group. You don't know which names, but you know there may be one team you're equal and the other two will be below you. Yeah. So you can say, we should get through the group without even knowing who the group is. But then to say that we should then go on to the semi-final before we know who we're going to play, mm. it's ridiculous. And, yeah. you know, and life is like that. And all that does is put pressure on you, which makes you more tense, which makes you worse, and then the media jumps on again. Now, the pressure, the pressure is fine if you are Germany, because you're the best, and the best should win. Mm. The pressure will be on England if they then play against Iceland, which they should have won and they lost. Mm. But handling that pressure from an outside perspective shouldn't influence you. What should influence you in terms of whether you win or lose is the team you're playing against who may be better than you. And yeah. we have to understand England aren't the best team. Mm. So why should we, yes, with luck and we work hard, we can beat the best teams. 
but chances are that's why you know you always go to bookmakers and bookies aren't stupid no so if you ask the bookies you know if england play germany in the quarterfinals why don't they make england the favorites then if we should win yeah yes we can win and then the bookies may take a hit because we've won but the reality is that the bookies and life tells you that they should beat us because they're better than us but we can beat them mm. Mm. Where did your passion for football come from? Can you remember a time where you Well, my dad, my dad played football for Jamaica. My dad was a colonel in the army, right. and there's no professional football. So being a colonel in the army, he played football for yeah. Jamaica. He managed the national team, was the president of the JFF, so I grew up playing football ever since I was three, four, five mm. years old. You know, in the Caribbean, cricket's obviously a big sport, and my school was by Sabina Park, the home of West Indian cricket in Jamaica, as far as mm. I'm concerned. But I, I, I played cricket, but football, it was always football for me, always mm. football. So really, do, do you remember that your dad sort of really pushed you into Not it or all. you just watched him? My dad never pushed me into it. In right. fact, I used to swim competitively before I played football competitively. Right. My sister swam for Jamaica, both my sisters. My sister swam for Jamaica and I used to go and swimming in the national stadium for a club, one of the best clubs in Jamaica when I was like six, seven, eight. But I, we trained every day, mm. every day. But then walking over to the national stadium, to, to, because we lived across the road from it, to train every day, I would stop off and play football with my friends instead of going to training. And my dad said, if you're not going to go to swimming training every day, stop swimming. Yeah. Stop swimming. Because my dad was someone, if you're going to do something, you do it properly. So my f swimming career ended when I was nine. Mm. I'd always played football and then, you know. So, um, but he didn't, he said, whatever you do, you do it with authenticity. Um, you give it 100%. You train hard. He didn't, he didn't say, he said, if you didn't want to play football, don't. But whatever you want to do, you do it yeah. with um, the right integrity. Mm. And I didn't need encouragement to do football with the right integrity because I just loved doing it. So I was out all day playing, playing, training. Then when I went to Watford with Graham Taylor, it was just about training, training, training. Listen, you look at any player, and I say this to kids all the time, never mind looking at Ronaldo and Messi. Because what you see of Ronaldo and Messi, and what you love about Ronaldo and Messi, and what you think Ronaldo and Messi are all about, is when you see them for three minutes doing whatever they do. What you don't see is what they do Monday to Friday. Mm. So I say, when you... And, I, and this is exactly, I say this to my kids, and your son would be exactly the same, or you should tell him the exact same thing. When you see the finished product of what happens on a Saturday, like when you take an exam, and I say to my kids, you know, when you take an exam at school, you don't pass that exam on the day you take it. You pass it in the preparation leading up to it. Mm. And that's what people don't see in football. They see Messi and Ronaldo doing what, and they want to do that, but what they don't see is the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, during training, after training, extra work they actually do. And that is what life is. Mm. And I knew that when I was a young. Unfortunately, I was in an environment, A, from my parents to begin with, B, going to Watford with Graham Taylor, who really endorsed that fact of just training and attitude and de determination and commitment, humility, respect for the sport, respect for the people, then coming to Liverpool. Mm. All clubs aren't like that. All families aren't like that. Yeah. So I was very lucky, first from my family upbringing, then the clubs I actually went to, because I know other clubs which wouldn't have endorsed those qualities. Mm. So. Once again, luck, fate, the direction that everything took me in happened to be, for me, the right one. Yeah. How did it feel when you signed for Liverpool? <laughs> Look, I signed, football has changed. You have six good games, ten good games, half a year, you sign for a big club like Liverpool, Arsenal, Man United, how great is that? I was at Watford for six years. We finished second in the league to Liverpool, Man United finishing third, mm. FA Cup final. I already played for England for four years. So when I came to Liverpool at 23, I was an England international who was fully experienced, well embedded in the fabric of top quality English football. Coming to a big club like Liverpool was great, but I was able to handle that because I'd done that. What we have now, the problem we have is these young kids who have six months for their club, wherever, and all of a sudden they've been signed for 20 million to go and play in the top. They can't handle that yeah. situation. They're not even ready for it. They're not shown a level of consistency to then show that they should be there. Mm. But once again, clubs like the academy systems, whereby they don't want to miss out on anyone, they take these, these young kids, and if you look at a lot of them who, whose careers, from Jack Rodwell, who's now at Sunderland, as a 16 year went to Manchester City, even Scott Sinclair is doing well up in, in Scotland, but you've got these kids who go to Man City, these huge clubs for a lot of money when they're young, without having proven themselves, and all of a sudden, where are their careers now? Mm. So that is why, when Peter Bersley came to Liverpool, the clubs would look at you, the top clubs looked at you, and they said, you have to show us that you have a level of consistency at the very highest level to show that you can come and play for us. So when we buy you, we know what we're going to get. Yeah, we don't make no mistakes. Yeah. We know what you're going to do. Whereas there's so much money in it now, and because mm. everyone's afraid of other people getting them, they'll take players, and what do they do? Just like with the academies, when they release them, ah, just yeah. let them go, let them go. You've got these talented players whose now careers who once upon a time were the best 16 year olds in England should be now at the ages of 25, 26, being the main players, A, at their big clubs, and B, with England, who we don't see them anymore. Mm. And no one, I, I just don't think anyone has any patience anymore with letting a player come in, 
You know, like at the moment, Liverpool, Salah, he's had a really good start. But most other players have come to Liverpool, even Suarez. Well, Salah has come, as, a, but Salah has come as, a, as, a, as an experienced player. Yeah, but he's, he's, he's played a while in Premier ago. League yeah, as well. Been, but he's come, he's, he's come as a seasoned player. Yeah. I'm talking about the young 19, 20-year-old players who've been around for one year, who then all mm. of a sudden are thrust into the limelight. Right. Um, so it's not a question of... Have, I'm, but, but once again, you know when I said about how with the academies... Um, and I'm talking about, I blame the parents because the club do what they do, but the parents are the ones who are saying, my son, and pushing the kids. Yeah. In many respects, the fans have a lot to answer for this. Because if you say, I love the idea of bringing young players in, because once upon a time you'd want your, if you're from Liverpool, for example, you want your neighbours, your sons to be part of the team, and you know, you'd know them, and like from Steven Gerrard, Jamie Carragher, Robbie Fowler, you want the players to come in. Football now in England have completely lost its identity, because at Barcelona, regardless of whether you have Messi, Neymar, who's now gone, Suarez, you need Catalans in the team. Never mind Spanish, you need Catalans in the team. Mm. I know we can get better players, but for our identity and for our fans, we need Catalans in the team. Spain, Real Madrid, we need Spanish in the team. Bayern Munich, we need Germans in the team. Here, do we really care whether there are any local players playing in the team? And as much as I then get the Liverpool job, yeah? And I'm going to say, listen, we want to have a bit of an, uh, 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 an identity, yeah? So I'll say to the fans, you know what? I'm going to put these four kids in. And they're not all Steven Gerrard. But what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to stick with them. Because they're good. If we stick with them, we support them. In a few years, they'll be better. You think if we lose matches, I'm not going to get a sack in three, four months? Oh, yeah. So what do I do? I better sign a player for 20 million. Just yeah. to save my job. Mm. To make sure that... Now, I spoke to Oliver Bierhoff about this in Germany. And he said in Germany, and interestingly, I just mentioned the fact that Germany in 2002 World Cup. Got to the World Cup final. So they could be forgiven for thinking they're a good team, but they knew they weren't. How did they get to the final? USA in the quarterfinals, South Korea in the semifinals. We would like to think that England could get to the final under those circumstances. But they weren't fooled in thinking when everything is right in German football. There are a lot of foreign players, a lot of old players, and then Oliver Berhoff said, we went to the clubs, he was working with the German Federation, and we said to Bayern Munich, the Dortmunds, we said to them, we need you to put young German players in your teams to help the national team. Now, even before they're ready. And we know that for three, four years, until they're ready, these are the Schweinsteigers, the Ozils, but you've got to stick with them. So the fans accepted it. The clubs accepted it because they're all locally owned. The managers were mainly German, so they have this identity of saying, and look at them now. Mm. Look at all the young players they have coming. So in England, can the English FA go to Manchester City, Liverpool, Arsenal, <laughs> and say, we need to put these young England kids in? And you know what? You may not win for a while. You may not do well. You have to have a long-term view, better. don't you, and take some pain in the short term to do that. And if the fans accept it, the clubs would do it. Mm. And as much as the fans go, yes, we will, we will, will they? No. Well, the culture is different now, isn't it? It's all instant of course it fix. Is. Of course it is. But the point I'm trying to make is that in other countries, they still want to retain a semblance of an identity. Whereas I think in England, we have completely lost our identity because we don't really care whether we have any local players playing as long as we win. Mm. So that's why I feel sorry for us at Wenger. Yeah. Oh, I think he's done a great job. And yeah, the, the, the fans will turn on him, some of them, and forget everything he's done for, what, 20 years or something? Well, that's football fans feel. Yeah, and they'll forget where Liverpool, uh, Arsenal were when he came in. and That's all why this. I say, well, not just that. Forget, be careful what you wish for. Mm. Because somebody else coming in, there's no guarantee that Arsenal will always, as they have done apart from last year, which they should have finished in the top four. Arsenal will end up finishing seventh or eighth for a while. Mm. And then what will the fans say then? Yeah. And, and, you know, if, if, even people who are getting on Klopp's back, I mean, you know, like... He's a said, proven listen, great manager. I'm not only, yeah, so he's maximised the potential. Yeah. So I say, if, and they're all top five managers are great managers. Mm. So Guardiola, Mourinho, Klopp, um, Tottenham, Pochettino, yeah. Wenger. Mm. So if you say you've got five top managers, and let's say they're not better than each other. Yeah, yeah. They all swap them around. Swap them around, yeah. yeah. So what they do is they maximise the potential of the team they had. Yeah. So if they're all the same, then you look at the players they have. So with the players they have, with the manager maximising that potential, where should they finish? Liverpool shouldn't be in the top four. Mm. Because if Guardiola managed Liverpool, with these same players without bringing the players in, they still wouldn't win still the league. still have the same defenders. Yeah. <laughs> still, they still, whoever you have, yeah. with that team, they would finish where they finish. They'd mm. finish fourth or fifth, which is what Klopp does, which is what Wenger does, they all do that. Mm. So to then say, let's get rid of the manager because a new manager coming in. And what I always say to, especially the Arsenal fans, and I say, okay, um, I will agree with you. If you can give me a name of someone who can do better. Mm. Guardiola, he's not coming. Simeone, he's not coming. Mourinho, he's not coming. A realistic name of someone. And they'll go, oh, anyone, just bring anyone in. I so say, you want anyone to come in? I'll bring Mickey Mouse in then. <laughs> you know, if you gave me a name of a manager who feasibly could do a better job, then maybe you can have this discussion. But fans will just go, oh, let's get rid of him. Why, who do you want to come in? 
It's very much like players. When people talk about you know, players at any club, we've got to get rid of him. Who should come in then to make the team better? Messi, he's not coming. Ronaldo, he's not coming. The players who are going to come aren't better than what you have necessarily. You can take a chance, which they have done on Suarez, because I can tell you, as much as people go about Suarez now, whatever you want to say, if Manchester City, Manchester United, Chelsea had come in for Suarez, he would have gone there instead of Liverpool. Mm. But they didn't want him. So it actually worked with yeah. Suarez. It worked with Coutinho. It doesn't work with some players. Mm. So this whole idea, and I think what people have now found out, there's no, there's no magic formula in football. Sometimes you're lucky to get a player who it works for. Because I remember even the scout from Leicester now who went to Everton, and Everton fans were really happy because look what he plays he found out. I said, listen, for every Kante that came to Leicester, there would have been players who never made it. So you're lucky with Kante. It doesn't mean all of a sudden you are a magician who understands that. Because at Everton now, they're now complaining because the players they've signed said, that's a guy who came from Leicester who you were saying was a genius. There's no such thing. No. You know, you're lucky sometimes to get a player. You're unlucky to get a player. It's not a magic formula of these superhumans who, 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 who know great players and who are great, you know. Mm. Um, well, I think it was proven by Ranieri next season and they get rid of they him. They got rid of him, yeah. Which is you probably know. unfair. I mean, when but that's where you look at, that's, where, that's why I always play. I look at the fans and say, have a look at yourselves. Because mm. if you look at Newcastle, when um, Alan Pardew was there and they were giving him a stick, then all of a sudden he turned it around and then he left to go to Palace and they're all saying, oh no, stay, we want you to stay. But he knows the next two games where we lost, they're going to be on his back again, mm. you know. They're on Wenger's back. And what did Arsenal fans say when they're on Wenger's back? Okay, we love Wenger, but you know, if only we won a trophy, you know, we haven't won anything. Then they won the FA Cup twice in the last three years. You've won a trophy, are you still happy? Uh, I said, hang on a second, because they're never going to be happy. Mm. Never going to be happy. No. You're, um, you've got some experience in management? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in Celtic, yeah. Jamaica, and Tranmere. And to me, management looks hard. Um, and I think it's Management because football's hard. Yeah. Harder than management. Because management in football is not like real management. Right. Real management is where the manager is in control of his workers. In right. football, you're not. If I manage McDonald's and you're flipping the burger, I tell you to flip the burger. You don't flip the burger, you're out. In football, to use the, the, the analogy, still, but this is football, yeah? I'm the manager. You're the burger flipper. I tell you to flip the burger. You don't flip the burger. I get sacked. Mm. That's, why I'm, that's why managers now don't have any power. Because no. they haven't got the power of the players. Because if the players don't perform, we blame the manager. Yeah. Don't blame the players. And until players start taking responsibility, or not taking responsibility, being made to take responsibility. Because once upon a time, they used to boo players when they didn't perform. Yeah. Now you don't. If the players don't perform, you boo the manager. At least Arsenal is the biggest example of that. Mm. When Mesut Ozil plays for Germany, he's your best player and he performs. Forget the dynamics of whether he's happy or not. The reality of that situation is why he performs for Germany is because if he doesn't perform for Germany, the fans are going to hold him accountable. Mm. If he doesn't perform for Arsenal, the fans boo Arsene Wenger. Mm. Now, when Man United were in the Champions League semi-final and they played John O'Shea, Wes Brown, um, and whoever else they played at the back and they got through, because those players know if we don't perform, the fans aren't going to boo Alex Ferguson, they're going to boo us. Yeah. Whereas, and he, they, had, he actually and then, power, so when he? David Moyes is there, if they don't perform, we'll be David Moyes. Mm. So, this is where England is probably a little bit different than other countries because we let the players get away with not liking the manager and then blaming the manager. Mourinho won the league, the next year the players don't want to play for him. So, instead of saying to the players, A, you don't play for Mourinho, you play for Chelsea, you play for the shirt, you play for us. I've gone to Newcastle, spent 200 quid on tickets, and you don't want to play because you don't like the manager, and I'm going to boo the manager. Now at Barcelona, Real Madrid, you don't play for the manager. Messi and Ronaldo don't care who the manager is. They play because they play for, the, for, for the, their own pride, for their own egos, they want to be big players. It doesn't matter who the manager is. Whereas in England, we've now got to the stage whereby if players don't like the manager, they don't have to perform. Like Ranieri, what's happened to Shakespeare now? They don't perform and the managers bear the brunt of it. Mm. The managers have always bore the brunt of, of that, even in foreign countries, whereby he'll get the sack. But what the players have done is they've played for the club. And there's no way that Lionel Messi won't perform because he may not like the manager. But unfortunately, we've got to the situation now subconsciously in England whereby the players are in a comfort zone to know we don't perform, we come off the field having lost five in a way to Swindon, and we're not accountable because they're not going to boo me. They're going and to therefore, the they're not going to play as well. It's subconscious. Mm. And that never includes any player of not trying. No. But you know, if the going gets tough and we don't perform and we come off, they're going to go, oh, don't worry about it. And we went through the situation with Torres at Liverpool. When Torres wasn't performing, we weren't blaming Torres. We are saying, he's, and he convinced himself it's because he's not in a good team, instead of looking at himself in the mirror. Mm. And then when he went to Chelsea, it didn't work, and it hasn't worked for him since, because we over-empower our players, our yeah. superstar players in this country. Because he was a great player. But when you make your players in this country bigger than the team, that's what happens. 
So how often have we seen players coming on television, the big players, and saying, oh, you know, I want to go because the club's ambition doesn't match my own. And then the fans have got the club. Now for a club, any club, Crew Alexander, any club who's been around for 100 years, we don't care who, which player comes in the last five years and how good you are, our club is more important than you. Mm. But when fans say that, Man United, when, when, when Wayne Rooney talked about Man United when he got his 250 million a year contract and he wanted to leave and you know, the club's ambition and his and Sir Alex Ferguson had to give him a new contract and he must have killed Sir Alex to do that. Mm. You know, under different circumstances, any player who did that in the old days, who crosses Sir Alex Ferguson, you have Stan, David Beckham, anybody, they're out. Mm. But he saw the power shift whereby he knew that player was becoming more powerful. So wait, what happened to Wayne Rooney? He had to get a new contract. Yeah. That would never have happened. Players now are superstar players, A, have been put above the club, seen as more important than the club. Suarez, other people, they're more important. We need to keep him because we can't let Luis go. Our club's been around for a long time. We'd be much more So if he wants to go, off he goes. But no, we've got to keep Suarez. And secondly, they've become more important than their teammates. Now, what we can't do as football fans is help the way fans see us. And I suppose fans have always seen the superstar players are better than their teammates. But what should never happen, and what didn't happen, is the superstar players didn't see themselves as better than their teammates. Mm -hmm. So with Russian Dal Gleish, I'm sure the fans thought Russian Dal Gleish are great. And maybe Jimmy K, Sam Lee, they're okay, but they're done. But if they saw themselves, but what Russian Dal Gleish couldn't do is see themselves as more important. Yeah. Why that is, is because what that then does, if you over empower the superstar players above their teammates, is that the superstar players, which was always the case, will then either see themselves or be seen as responsible for when they win. But when they lose, it's not their fault. Mm. Now, what has to happen is the There's superstar no players yeah. have to take responsibility when they lose. And in fact, that's what used to happen. Because if I walk through town, here, we used to stay here at the most it's funny because this was the Moat House Hotel before this was built where we stayed for a year when we first came and town. If I walk through town and Liverpool lost, fans will say to me, Barnes, Barnsy, you were crap. Yeah. You know why they say that? Because they'll expect me to win them the game. Yeah. They don't expect Gary Ablett to win them the game or Barry Venison. So they're not going to have a go at Barry Venison for not winning. They're going to have a go at me. Whereas now that doesn't happen. When we don't win, they don't blame Suarez. They don't blame um, um, they blame Lucas. Yeah. So we blame the lesser players. What that then does is that makes the big players not responsible when they lose. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. The accountability when things aren't going well. Listen, we're all great when things are going well. Everybody can be great. Mm. How great can we be when things aren't going well? Because we have to be made accountable and we don't make them accountable. Mm. Mm. Who's your favourite manager? Uh, either play under or you just think is great manager? Well, Graham Taylor had the biggest effect on me as a young 17 year old boy. Coming to Liverpool took it on another level because of, and that's more to do with the history and traditions of the club because mm. Kenny didn't coach. Kenny just continued what Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, Joe Fagan went before him, mm. and he was very, very clever in getting the best out of players. And he was a fantastic manager in that respect. I don't think there was necessary. Obviously, Kenny tinkered with a, a few things, but I think Kenny just allowed Liverpool to continue. Whereas Graham Taylor really started this, this thing, and it's so interesting because you know I went back to Watford, and Watford fans were saying to me, you know, you always talk about Liverpool, you got Watford. I said, I said, and, and it just struck me the other day. I said, I always talk about how great it was at Watford, learning. I love. I, I wouldn't have wanted to go to Liverpool as a 17-year-old. Great at Watford for the six years. But it's interesting, I only thought about it the other night, and I suppose why that is, is because when I came to Liverpool, and I say I feel like I played under Bill Shankly, because whatever we did, Bill Shankly started, you had an institution, you're aware of the club, of the history and the traditions of Liverpool. When I played for Watford, it was Graham Taylor. It wasn't because I didn't, I don't think Watford had that, that history and, 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 and this identity. Graham Taylor, for me, started that Watford identity. So it happened to be Watford, but it was Graham Taylor. Mm. Now, had Graham Taylor been managing someone else and I'd gone there, it would have been the same, but it would have been Graham Taylor at Luton, at, at Cambridge, whatever it was. Whereas at Liverpool, it's not Kenny Dalglish, it's not Joe Fagan, it's not Bob Paisley, it's the history of Liverpool and what that actually stands for, which is much more impactful. So when I say I remember my Watford days, and even when we go back, and this is where Liverpool is a unique club, the thing about Liverpool is that you have this identity of playing for, for Liverpool Football Club. Other clubs have an identity of playing in certain eras. If you played for Leeds, and you have, of course, the ones from the 40s, 50s, 60s aren't around anymore, but if you have a Leeds get-together with all the players who played for Leeds throughout history, what you'll have, you'll have the Leeds team of the 70s with Billy Bremner, then you'll have Gary McAllister's Leeds who won the league, who will identify with that period and mm. that period. At Liverpool, when we get together and you've got players from the 50s, players from the 80s, players from the 90s, players from the 70s, some successful players, some not successful players, we all identify with having played for Liverpool. Mm. Whereas that for me doesn't happen at other clubs. You know, with Manchester United, there'll be the 67 Busby Babes, then there'll be Fergus teams. And the others in between, yes, you play for Man United, but you don't have that identity. 
because you never played in the 67 team or the Fergus teams, the team from the 90s and 80s for, 80s, for example. You know, they played for Man United, whereas we meet players from Liverpool who played three times for Liverpool, who were on the bench, and we still identify with them as being our teammates because of what Liverpool stands for. That's mm. why I think Liverpool is a unique club. Watford, for me, was about Graham Taylor. Yeah. Not, not Watford. And once Graham Taylor left, that changed. So the Watford, after Graham Taylor left, when I left in 87, they don't identify with, 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 with Graham Taylor's Watford, for example. Whereas at Liverpool, it doesn't matter what era you played in. Once you played for Liverpool, you identify with each other. Mm. Yeah, um, I've been a Liverpool fan since I was three. Mm. I, f I feel that. So um, two friends of mine who've had to really undergo difficulties to reinvent themselves in their career is Frank Bruno and Gerald Ratner, both of whom, you know, coming out of boxing must be so hard. And I've talked to Frank about that a lot. And then Gerald Ratner, who had his problems and had seven years in the wilderness. He's, he's so successful again. And both those chaps, the most down-to-earth people. That's why you've got to be careful what you say. Well, exactly. <laughs> um, but just I see you've got a lot of old tat in your wrist there, haven't you? That's no. not Gerald's, is it? <laughs> no, 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 that's not. Look, hey, listen, wait listen, a minute. Listen, you aren't come on, on, I'm only joking, I'm only yeah, joking. But no. look, I remember Gerald Ratner and I said, and then, listen, that's how ridiculous the whole situation is. Listen, if I'm going to go into a jewellery store and I'm going to buy something for 20 quid, what do I think I'm getting? Yeah, exactly. You just don't want to be told. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the reality? So, that, so that's crazy. Now, when you talk about reinventing yourself, I think a lot of that, not necessarily Gerald Ratner, but I think from Frank's point of view, I was with Frank the other day. And I learned this once again, A, from the way I was brought up as a young player, and young person with my family, and also when I went to, to, to Wat Watford. So I learned this from an early age. Don't believe the hype. Because mm. Graham Taylor said to me, even with the press, he goes, you know, the press, the press, at our time when I played for England with the press, and he goes, when I was 18, and when I played for Watford, they loved me. Because Watford were beating Arsenal and Liverpool, and they loved that. Yeah, I remember but when I played for phrase. England, yeah. when I played for England, they were criticising me. I was mm. like, he said, listen, you know when you, when you play for Watford and they say you're brilliant and you're great? He said, do you believe them? He said, well, if you believe them, when you play for England and they say you're crap, you've got to believe that as well. So you know who you are, you make your own mind up about what you do, and you, don't take, you take it with a pinch of salt. Secondly, what made a big impression on me, which I understood when I finished playing, is that when I played for Watford as a 19, 20 year old, I saw all players come back to the club who played 10 years earlier who aren't playing anymore. And I saw the way, either the fans or the way they were treated. And at 18, I went, you know what? When I finish playing, that could be me, where no one wants to know you. So as much as they love you now, you have to understand that once you finish, that will be it. So I understood it completely. So when I retired, and of course things didn't come to me the way it did when I played, I completely accepted it. The problem a lot of people have is when they're actually there and people tell them they love you and everything is great, they believe that this is going to always happen. When they haven't got that anymore and no one wants to know them, they went, that's what it's hard for them. Mm. And that's because I never believed all this stuff about how much we love you. Because even if you want to talk about in the 80s, bananas on the field, racism. Liverpool fans when I played for Watford racially abused me. Then when I came to Liverpool and I played well, they loved me. Mm. And Everton fans abused me. Had the same John Barnes, left Watford and went to Everton. Liverpool fans would have abused me. So they don't love me. They love yeah. the fact that it's John Barnes number 10 playing well for them. Yes. John Barnes number 10 playing badly would have got a lot of stick as my teammates for Liverpool who didn't play well got stick. So I understood that. So I took everything with a pinch of salt. The praise, but also... The criticism. Criticism. Yeah. And that's what you have to understand. Where a lot of people don't. A lot of people when they finish, all of a sudden when they either get criticised or they don't get anything at all, that's when it's hard for them. Mm. And I think that's what, you know, I think that's why how Frank I was with him the other day and I think he, I think he struggled with that mm. a lot. The fact that when he finished playing Gaza is the same. Yeah. You have a lot of players who struggle with not, you know, believe, well, they believed obviously that it, that would last forever. Mm. And as I said, listen, if it happens, because of course we all want nice things, we all want to be able to be given things even when we finish. And if we are, how nice is that? But if it's not, not a problem, mm. not a problem. And this was where I sort of wanted to lead because you've reinvented your career in a lot of ways. I mean, you've had to because you can't, when you finish football, you can't play football and you, you seem pretty pragmatic and balanced about it. I'm just, it's my life. Yeah. I haven't reinvented anything because I knew once I finished playing football, I'd have to continue my life. And I always continued my life when I played football. Mm. So I took my kids to school, I went to Tesco, I was a normal human being. And what we do, what we have to do as so-called people in the public eye, whatever you want to call us, we have to separate ourselves. There are two aspects of us. They're who we are and what we are. And I've never let them cross. Mm. I've always known who I am and who I am is John Barnes a husband, father, ex-husband, friend, enemy, a normal person like anybody else. What I am is John Barnes number 10, superstar, not superstar, fans hate me, fans love me. Mm. And that is my, and then what I then did when I finished playing is I continued who I am and who I always was. Mm. 
So I was never John Barnes number 10 who played for Liverpool, ever. So you, did, you didn't lose an identity because you knew who you never. were? Never. Mm. So, and I knew that once that stopped, I would just continue my life. I didn't have to reinvent myself. I continued doing what I always did. And it, wasn't, and it was a seamless transition. I didn't have to like either reinvent myself or, or struggle to then say, I've got to go back to normal life because I always had a normal. In fact, when we talked about looking at, I can't remember where we put it, the reality and then the, the dream. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, a huge dream and a little reality. And I said, it's a little dream and a huge reality. That's my life. Mm. My life has been my huge life and my little dream of being a footballer. And once that's gone, I just continued my huge life, which is very easy for me to do, which I always did. Yeah. Other people do the other way around. They have this huge dream, which is th what they are, and a little bit of a life. And then when that huge dream then goes, they then can't look at their little bit of a life whereby they're just a normal person who's got to go to Tesco's mm. because of what they were or what they thought they were. And they can't then translate that into, into being what they are. So it really was not an issue with me. Mm. That's why I say, listen, I remember when I used to go to, of course, nightclubs. You're a footballer. Cute. Just go straight to the queue. <laughs> and I knew, so... I knew when I finished playing, I might have to go to the back of the queue. Yeah. And they may turn me away. They say, you can't come in. Because I saw them doing it to other people. And I said, well, I'm like a normal person. So if, it, if someone sees me and they go, oh, come to the front. Isn't that nice? Thank you very much. But if they go, get to the back, I'll get to the back. Mm. Because that's what normal people do. Mm. And I suppose that transition is hard for people to do. But for me, it never was. Mm. And so what advice would you give to people struggling to move into a new career or holding on to their past career? Well, it's difficult once you are now in that situation. You really, the advice I will give is when you're actually getting into the career, yeah. don't believe the hype. Yeah. Because by then, in many respects, it's too late because you are now the character you are, whereby you are then trying to move back to then say, can I then handle the situation? Mm. That's why I'd much rather give advice to people going into it mm. rather than people who've come out the other end and they're now struggling. As much as they can then um, look in their own mind and, and, and rationalize it to then say, well, maybe when it was happening, I shouldn't have been, you know, thinking what I thought about how people would love me forever. But by then it's much harder to do because you're trying to rescue a situation. Yeah. That's why I much prefer to talk to people going into it and looking at them saying, don't believe all this because mm. this may not last when you finish. You never think it's going to end. Of course, because we think, and if it doesn't end, isn't that great? Mm. But if it ends, accept it. Yeah. So it almost sounds like when you're getting criticised, remember who you are and you're not as bad as they say. And then the opposite, I mean, when you're great. Say. Yeah. You know, all you have to do is come, and that's what Graham Taylor says, you please me, I'm your manager, your teammates, yeah? Fans, you try and please fans, yes, but fans will one week, very much like Alan Pardew, say we love you, then we hate you, you're great, then you're not. Brendan Rodgers, we loved him, now we don't like him. Yeah. Jurgen Klopp, we love at the moment, but there's some mur murmurs going on. And when they actually love you and you say, yeah, but oh, you know, you may, you may check, no, I'll never. Finished second in the league, love Brendan Rodgers, he's a fantastic manager. Now, never liked him. So many of my friends, and I said, yes, you did, no, I never. No, and, I never. And, yeah, and people talk about Liverpool should have won the league. I think Liverpool overperformed. Well, um, first of all, everybody's different. We all have different views, but I don't believe it's. It, first of all, I think it's impossible to overperform. Right. You can only maximize your potential. You can't do better than you can, but what you can do is underperform. Mm. And Liverpool didn't overperform. Liverpool maximized their potential, yeah. but other teams underperformed. Mm. Man City underperformed, because Man City should have won the league by 15 points. They won the league by three points against us. Yeah. So, like when I said about Usain Bolt, if I do 12 seconds, he does 11.9. Mm. I've maximized my potential. He's underperformed, even though he won. So Liverpool maximised their potential to do what they did and other teams, because if other teams maximised their potential, Liverpool would have finished fourth or fifth. Mm. We so, did go on a big unbeaten run though, didn't we, towards the end of the season, except right at the end. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that other teams should have won more points because yeah. if they maximised their potential, they would have beaten us, yeah. <laughs> you know? But that's football, that's mm. life. What do you do now in your career? Um, you know, what, what keeps you busy and interested? Well, my family are the most important thing. That keeps me interested. But of course, with seven kids, you're going to work. So I work. I'm an ambassador for Liverpool. I do TV work. And Liverpool now, with all, not just Liverpool, all the big clubs, they have sponsors mainly abroad. So India, China, Australia, Canada. So I've had 280 flights in two years. Wow. So that's where, that's where business is. Yeah. Football business for the big clubs is there. Nothing much in this country because, of course, you've got the stadiums, they're full, ticket sales, but all the sponsors, three in China, three in Australia, and that's what we do go abroad just to meet the sponsors and go yeah. to events and stuff. You enjoy that, do you? It's a lot of traveling. Yeah. You know, go to Indonesia for two days, to fly to Canada for one day to come yeah. home. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's still, and it's still football business, so you're still involved in football. So the best thing is to be a player. After you can't be a player, you'd be a manager. Can't be a manager, you're involved in punditry because you're still involved in football. So you kind of like are still involved, yeah. but um, in order. 
as we said before, I'd rather be a 25-year-old footballer. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, if you have to keep doing 280 flights in two years, because I do a few a year and I hate the jet lag. No, two years, um, yeah, yeah, no. no. Right. If I have to, then so I'm you, just going to drop down, I think. But yeah. I'm working towards not doing as much anymore. Yeah, and have you got any plans for... Well, for my that? kids now, are, I mean, listen, when you've got seven kids, you know, kids are expensive. But yeah. I've got two doctors, a banker, so now they're okay. I don't have to look after them anymore. Mm. My job now is obviously still a bank manager, a taxi driver. Um, <laughs> But I've got three little kids, so um, I'm hoping to do less less work. Mm, yeah. Less work. Yeah, of course. I would like the idea, as much people don't, of actually doing nothing. Yeah, you, you'd like that, would you? Yeah. You could do that for 20 years, 30 Absolutely. years. I couldn't do that for five minutes. But it won't be anything, because, of course, with your family and stuff that you've got to do, yeah. you will be doing stuff, but I'm talking about doing... Because, you see, I, have, I don't have a passion. A passion is football, so I can't be a footballer because I'm 54. If I could manage... I would love to manage. Um, I would have to be able to afford to manage, and at this moment I can't afford to manage, meaning that obviously with kids and responsibilities, where I'm going to manage at a club that will probably pay me no more than 40, 30,000, 40,000 pounds a year, um, and not do anything else, whereas I can do things to make money, whereas if you're a full-time manager, I can't afford to do that. If I was in a financial situation to do that, I would do that, mm. 100%. Yeah. Okay, so just a couple more questions I want to Thank you in advance for your time. So um, I think I may know the answer to this, but I'm going to chuck it out there anyway. Um, but is there anything in your life you'd have done differently? Any regrets or anywhere, <coughs> any sort of segue where you thought should have gone there and not there? Lots. Ah, you surprised but, me. No, 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 no. Who, who, looking back, but I wouldn't do anything differently. Mm. And I'll tell you why, because there are lots of mistakes we made in the past. Um, things, when you say you regret, I regret them, but I would still do them. And I'll explain why I'll still do them, um, because of course there are things that we do which aren't nice. Um, however, why I say I would still have to do them is because where I am at this moment in time, I'm completely happy, completely satisfied. And what you're actually saying is that if I could go back in time and change something I did, which means that my fate would have been changed, I may not be here today. Mm. I'm not talking about sitting here. I would not be where I am today in this happy place that I am. Because what we all assume is that if we go back and change what we've done, we will it still be either be here or we will be better. Yeah, but it could be worse. <laughs> Chances are, you look what goes on in the world, look what goes on, not just in the world, look what goes on in our lives and we look at other people and we feel our lives could be better but our lives could be infinitely worse. And am I willing to take that chance of changing mistakes I made in the past to hopefully be in a better place or am I satisfied with where I am, mm. which meant that everything I did, all the horrible things, whatever was necessary, so as much as I regret them because they weren't nice to do, I wouldn't change them because yeah. I may change my destiny now. Mm. So, yes, I regret things that I've done in the past, yeah. but I wouldn't change them. Mm. Okay. This podcast um, is, I generally like to interview people who I perceive to be quite disruptive, different, interesting, unique. I um, handpick all the people I want to interview. Um, and well, I think what, those adjectives, the disruptive one is not me. No, okay. I don't know which one I am, but uh, I'm definitely not the disruptive <laughs> yeah. one. So, but what does that word mean to you? Does that word mean anything to you? Disruptive? Well, disruptive can mean many things. Disruptive can be very good um, in the sense of if you're a footballer and a disruptive, um, it can be good and bad. It could be, you could be affecting the harmony in the dressing room yeah. or you could be affecting the opposition to be disruptive in the penalty box. So, mm. um, but I'm talking about in the, in, the, in, the, in the real sense of the world of disruptive, I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of it, to be honest with you, but I do like order. Mm. I came from a military background. And really? I think that in football, and that's why subconsciously, and as I said, these lessons that you learn, like when you take exams, they subliminally go in. So when you're studying, you don't even know that you're, you're absorbing what you're absorbing. Then all of a sudden, mm. when the exam comes up, you see a question and you go, I know that answer. You don't remember the, the minute that you actually remember that. I remember seeing that question three days ago when I was studying on page six, but it's, it stays in there. So the way I was actually brought up subliminally with my parents, because of course, when you're growing up, you don't like them because they're very strict and they're very, and you know, I have to go to training when my friends are going out playing and I'm not allowed out and I've got to do this and you want to do that. But that actually forms your character. Yeah. Um, so I think that subliminally, the way that you actually are is, 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 is from a very, very young age. And I've been very fortunate to be in the environment that has made me the person I am. So I do like order. Mm. As much as I didn't at the time, and people think you don't. So people always thought that I was such a, a maverick footballer who just plays off the cuff, which we think about Messi and Ronaldo, mm. but they're not. Mm. They're very structured. Barcelona mm. football is very structured. They look at it and they think, oh, they're just playing with their eyes closed, and they don't, <laughs> Brazilian samba, and it's just like, they don't really care. They don't, it's very ordered. Yeah. 
Yeah. As much as it looks as if it's fluent, Manchester City, Pep Guardiola just goes and gets the players to play and just go. No, he doesn't. Mm. Everything is structured, and that is the way I like my life. That yeah. is the way. As much as people don't see it that way, so I do like order. So I don't like disruptive. Yeah. Okay. Great. So critics, we've all gotten one of mine once said to me, "If I was a cake, I'd eat myself," which I think is probably the best um, cr- critic I've ever had. Um, have you dealt with it? Have you stayed balanced and down to earth about it? But I, I, I said to you when Graham Taylor said to me when I was having a problem with some of the press from England, when I, and he said when he played with Watford, take it with a pinch of salt because yeah. you can be who you are. You can't control what people think or say about you. You control your actions and what you do and your integrity. And if you do things with the right intention, then it doesn't matter what, what, what critics say. Mm. Um, so intention is the most important thing. And that is where in this environment we live in, this, this day and age, people should should adhere to that a little bit mm. more. Because so many people are getting in trouble because of things, the perception of things they say when it is obvious they don't mean it that way. And if it's obvious they don't mean it that way, does it really matter? Just to give you an example, I remember when Alan Hansen, this whole thing about when, and this is where, you know, when things change, you know, once upon a time you couldn't call black people black, they were colored. Then all of a sudden you can't call them colored, they're black. Mm. And of course, if you're a certain age brought up in a certain era and you talk, about them, then you say whatever you say with, with, with no intention one way or the other. Mm. And in fact, his intention was to be, to be, to be um, complimentary to them. He was saying how great colored players have made the league. But he said colored instead of black. So people were calling for him to be sacked because he said colored instead of black. Yeah. Now, and you know that now yeah. but not even knowing him, his intention was a compliment mm. to say that they are great. But he said colored instead of black. So instead of people saying, forget what he said, what are his intentions? And his intentions are to compliment them now, if he said the right word, black, and he said, but all black people are criminals, then that's wrong because, mm. you know, so you got the word right, but you got the intention wrong. Yeah. So that is why we have to really look at intention. And for me, that is what, that is, that is what it's all about. Mm. So, um, I, I'm with you 100% on that. Is it fair to say when someone gets a lot of harsh criticism, though, it's kind of like, we can talk about it now, but when it hurts, it's hard. I mean, some things must it is, but No, but as I said, you know, from a young age, and Graham Taylor, you know, we had this conversation, and even with the parents, and as I said, but, but, and that is why I also said, I take the praise with a pinch of salt as well, mm. because we have to be who we are, and as I said, we're going with authenticity, we're going with integrity, and if people say you're great, people say you're bad, even the people say you're great, and because I've separated who I am and what I am, so from a, from a what I am perspective, in terms of John Barnes number 10, yeah, but in terms of who I am, it's different. Mm. So the criticism John Barnes get, I understood. So you're able to put the what who that, yeah. what you do and who you are. Who you're I am able different. To separate. So, so exactly. So I didn't take it personally. Yeah, mm. and I think this will explain it. When I managed Celtic, and and I had the second best win record of any Celtic manager in history at the time. And when I got the sack, mm. if you look at the win record that I had percentage, it was 65%, Jockey was 66 a lot of them had less than me. But the whole dynamic of he's not one of us, and we lost a couple of games, we lost in Venice, so I got the sack. But anyway, the reality was the football was okay. But anyway, mm. but the point I'm trying to make about that is why I felt the most offended I felt. Forget about it, they could say he's a crap manager, we're losing games, no, 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 it's terrible, he's whatever they want to say about me. What upset me more than anything else was when they said that he's aloof and arrogant. More than where they, they wanted to believe I'm a bad manager, I'm not a bad manager, because mm. once again, you can't please people. Because Mourinho is a crap manager. Mourinho is a great manager. What is he? Yeah. Someone said he's great, someone said he's not. Liverpool fans will say whatever, Chelsea fans, but the reality is you are who you are. Yeah? As a manager, that's, that's objective. Yes, he's not. But for me, the insult of saying that as a person that I was aloof and arrogant hurt me more than whatever they want to say about mm. whether they like me as a manager or not. Because I know that that, that, is a, that, that that is talking about me as a person and it is something I'm not. And I'll defend myself to the hilt on that. I can't defend myself to the hilt as a manager. Because even if you win all your matches and people don't like you, like look at Mourinho. Mourinho won the league with Chelsea. And then the next year, mm-hmm. they sacked him. Is he a bad manager? Is he a good manager? So that's yeah, not they important. Loved him for the, loved him and hated him for the same thing that he was. The same thing that he did. But, yeah. so, but therefore, so therefore uh, the point of what I'm trying to make is from a professional perspective, I handle criticism. Easily, mm. easily. So when people used to go, Barnsley, you are great, you're fantastic. I used to go, oh, yeah, thanks very much. But under different circumstances, the Everton fans would go, ah, he's not that great. Yeah. So what am I? Mm. That's why, as Graham Taylor said, you make your own mind up as to how good you think you are, how good you are. You're not as good as people are making out. Mm. And you're not as bad as people are making mm. out. 
Okay, and then so finally, because you do sound like someone who is comfortable and knows who you are, if someone's going a bit lost in their life, you know, they might be getting divorced, they might have some difficult situations and they feel lost, how do you know who you are? You, for me, I don't let outside influences affect me. And a lot of that comes from your perception of the outside influences in your life. My friends, my family, him, her, press, whatever, Look at, at, at who you are and don't be affected by what's going on outside. And unfortunately, that's what people are affected at. And that is why I look at people. My son is a doctor and he talks about depression. And not, not his depression. And his wife actually, she's a, psych a, psych a psychiatrist. And the new thing now is that lots of people are depressed. Lots of people are depressed. And for me, and my son actually says, and clinically, depression, if people who suffer from depression, Real depression are people who are depressed when they've got no reason to be depressed. When things are going well, everything is fine, but they're depressed. That's real depression. Mm. A lot of people we see now are depressed when things aren't going well. When things aren't going well, they're not depressed. And what they're doing is they're letting outside influences affect the way they feel. Mm. And that is why I say, don't let outside influences affect what you do. You do everything with integrity, with honesty, within yourself to mm. know that you have made the right decision for what you want or you believe and don't let outside influences influence you. I mean, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to do, but it's very fortunate, A, first of all, with who I was brought up, but secondly, the experiences I went through football at an early age, when my managers were very intelligent men, Kenneth Alglish, Graham Taylor particularly, really, and I suppose I would have thought this way anyway through my mother, my mother was into spirituality and into all kinds of different things, so I, I believe this even at a, at a young age, but I see a lot of people and I see them having fun and laughing, then things don't go their way, then they're depressed and then mm. all of a sudden they're up and they're down and they're allowing outside things to influence them. I don't let anything outside influence me. Mm. Even like when, um, because obviously, you know, even with my, 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 my wife now, and um, you know, obviously, I've got divorced and you know what football's like in the old days, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, listen, this is, not, this is not who I am and it's not because of you. I love you, but I, and, and I will never ever cheat on you. And it's not that I love you so much that I wouldn't cheat on you. I love you as much as anybody can love anybody else. But it's not that I love you so I wouldn't cheat on anybody I'm with now. Yeah? And as much as I suppose a lot of women want to hear, it's because of me, but you may cheat on somebody else. It's got nothing to do with you. It's to do with who I am. And I suppose in my life now, in terms of my happiness, um, in terms of the way I look at the world, it's got nothing to do with what's going on. Look at the way, I suppose what I'm trying to say is look inward, don't look outward. And that's a great place to finish. John, thank you very much. Thank you.